Now, once you get to Oxford, um, your story really begins to celebrate how Marin's life starts to, to thrive and flourish. Uh, and unfortunately, you feel a bit left behind. <laughs> <laughs> talk, yeah. about, talk about that chapter, what it meant for you personally, and, and how, you, how you grew through it. Yeah. Yeah. I describe our 10 years of infertility as like the wilderness journey. And uh, it feels like we're just going around in circles and it's dusty and dirty and we're tired and it's hot and we don't know where we're going. We don't know what God is doing. Um, when we get to Oxford, yeah, it's almost as if Merrin enters the promised land. Uh, and she was offered this great job at Oxford University. That's a pretty good gig to get, don't you think? Uh, it's a pretty good one to take up. And so when we arrive, things start to go really well. And that is an answer to prayer because we've come a long way from Australia to the UK. And we were always thinking it was going to be at least a medium term decision, if not a long term stay that we would be making. Just say we got here and it didn't work out. Oh, my goodness. You know, broken dream after broken dream after broken dream, that would be. Well, no, it was a wonderful new beginning for Marin, just what she needed. I had, uh, things were going very well for me in Australia. Um, and I had launched a show, a radio show, uh, that was quite unique, um, certainly in the Australian scene, perhaps even at the world scene, in a way that uh, we would engage the mainstream mind of the Australian um, culture with the things of faith. And we would invite atheists on to talk about faith and we would uh, have all sorts of people call in every Sunday night when the show aired. Uh, and that itself was another 10-year dream. Really, Resurrection Year talks about two 10-year dreams, one that didn't come true, one that did come true, but then, because the first one didn't come true, the second one actually had to be relinquished. And that was a tough time because the thing that I dreamt about for 10 years that I had, I had to let go after a very short period of time of enjoying it. Um, things were going well on the publishing side. My books were getting published and uh, I had what they call a platform. Everybody wants that if you're going to be in publishing. Um, great speaking engagements, um, opportunities to speak at Australian Parliament House and address MPs and senators and all sorts of things. Coming to the UK and that uh, beloved platform is all gone. And so I'm meeting with publishers and they're saying, okay, well, you know, your book idea that I was working on at the time, that sounds fine, but who are you? Who's Sheridan Voisey? The BBC weren't returning my phone calls when it came to broadcasting. Um, and uh, I was left twiddling my thumbs really at home wondering, okay, what is my life to be? And that started really a real journey of wrestling with my identity. And I guess I, I understood, Brad, that to some degree I'd started to really build my identity around the show, uh, my success, whatever small amount I had of it. Um, and I think that's always a challenge, particularly for us guys, not limited to guys, but certainly it is. And I had to really have all that stripped away to recognize actually at the very, very heart mm. of my identity is the fact that I'm a child of God. And no matter what, sickness, uh, failure that can never be taken away, but it was um, mm. it was a difficult old time. You know, when we read Christian books like this, um, we're almost schooled to expect the happy ending. You know, a nice tidy resolution where you actually get what you've always wanted. Um, and I don't think it gives anything away, but your book ends differently. Uh, talk talk a bit about that and your your reflections on the Christian need for happy endings and yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. The great switch that happened in our story is the very fact that a book has come out of it. Because as I've already told you, publishers weren't interested. Um, and then it was my friend Adrian Plass again, who one night after hearing our story, the, the full details of it, then said, you know what, you should be writing that as your story. You should be writing that book. And uh, very reluctantly, I didn't want to write this story. I didn't think Merrin, my wife, was ever going to agree to it. Uh, I sat down uh, in January of 2012 and started typing it out. And uh, once I had a few chapters, I started to approach, you know, some publishers again. And funnily enough, the situation was quite different. They started reading those first few words and they were captivated by them. Um, not without some difficulty, though, the, the book actually did get picked up and, uh, and did actually get published. But we do have this desire to have this picture perfect fairy tale ending. And when you think about it, Brad, most of our sermons actually are the success stories. Uh, most of the Christian TV programs we listen to are the success stories. They're the testimonies, aren't they? They're the, my life was really, really bad. 
And then God came in and my life is really, really good. And so it's very true. As you're reading Resurrection Year, you're waiting for the kid to come. As, a, as somebody said to me, they said, you're going to get the kid, right? You're going to get the kid. I'm reading the book. You're going to get the kid, aren't you? You're going to get the kid. Well, just read the book and see if we get the kid. But I can tell you now that this is the big thing that I've learned through this whole difficult time is that God may not sometimes bring a miracle into every story, but he will often bring a surprise. And that's certainly the case for us. And again, I think we need to learn, learn that. Uh, keep, keep in mind that even the resurrected Jesus has scars on his hands. Now, that's profound. That's profound. Even the incarnate God, <laughs> when he's raised from the dead, after all his trial and tribulation, there's still scars. And he will take those scars on into eternity as a, a mark of what he went through for us. Uh, is there not something in us in that for us to reflect on as well, that there will be something in which, no, the answer isn't always healing, the answer isn't always rescue, uh, but often the answer is redemption. God will take the pain and the suffering and will twist it, turn it around, turn it into something very, very surprising, uh, something good for you and something especially good for other people. That's what we've discovered. I guess my final question for you, Sheridan, uh, it's, it's a delightful book, it's an inspiring book, and, and it's useful, I think, for lots of people you know, beyond um, the, the exact experience of infertility. Just talk to me about who, who should I be giving this book to? Um, mm -hmm. who, who, should, who should I be thinking about um, that would be helped by this book? Yeah, it's a delightful question because it certainly is not a book just for the infertile couple. A number of couples are actually uh, reading the book and finding some inspiration and some help through that. In fact, I'm, just, I'm getting emails every day from people whose lives are not just uh, enriched by the book, they're cha being changed by the book. And this is the great story of redemption that God does bring through stories. Um, but this book is much bigger than just simply the whole issue of uh, broken dreams in, in the area of infertility. This is for anybody who's had a broken dream. This is for the... Uh, artist whose art hasn't made it to the masses. This is for the musician whose songs are not getting downloaded by, by the thousands on iTunes. This is for the career woman who had to let go of her career, the career man who maybe had his career taken away from him, had to, to lose it, his dream career. Uh, this is for the person who prayed for somebody to be healed and they weren't healed lost a loved one, lost a child. This is for anybody who's had a broken dream. Because, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it, the broken dream can be very different for each one of us, but the emotional and spiritual journey that it takes us on is almost identical for most of us. All the same feelings. Is my life meaningful because I can't be who I am? I can't be who I wanted to be? There's a big issue of identity there. My wife wanted to be a mum. That's an identity statement. She couldn't become a mum. Well, who can she become? Who is she? So those questions will always go through your mind no matter what kind of uh, broken dream you're wrestling with. So the book is written for anybody who's experienced a broken dream or the friends thereof. And it uh, delights me no end to hear most people say, I can think of five people that I want to give this book to. And most of them have got different kinds of broken dreams or just need some inspiration. Sure. Well, Sheridan, I'm so grateful for uh, you and Marin making the risky choice to be vulnerable and to share your story. And we wish you, you know, the best on the success of the book and pray that God will use it as a vehicle for our hope and healing for, for countless people. So yeah. thanks so much for your time today. Blessings on you. And uh, we'll look for you down the road and to see uh, what next great work you'll do. Uh, thanks so much, Brad. Great conversation. Really appreciate it. Have a great day.